Hello everyone, I think as we're already sufficiently caffeinated and, and happy, we can just uh, get right into it. Hello, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. I welcome you wholeheartedly to our second session. And, um, but before, before kicking into our session, there's a question for uh, uh, Ms. Ute Stiegel. So I would, I would like to first start with that question and then we will proceed with our uh, panel. So the question is, uh, would you agree with the statement that fighting corruption can be achieved in a sustainable manner only by teaching integrity and, and moral behavior from a very young age? Thank you. Now, all good. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the question. No, um, indeed, uh, it's education is an important part of, of prevention of corruption, and we need to start with preventing corruption. First of all, we should uh, prevent uh, corruption, as it was said already, uh, uh, and. Uh, Prevention of corruption is mitigating then also the need uh, for repression of corruption and education is an, an important part and uh, the earlier it starts the better it is because in the end uh, preventing corruption is all about uh, creating uh, a culture of, of integrity, accountability, transparency uh, and uh, this uh, can only uh, be achieved also by by uh, starting early uh, with educating people to to uh, value that. So I agree with the statement, but it's of course not the only uh, preventive uh, measure that that is needed. There are other measures that are equally important relating to transparency, transparency, accountability, like for example disclosure of conflict of interest disclosure of, of, of assets and also there will always be also a need for, for repressive measures. Perfect, thank you. Okay, now let's, let's start all over again. So, uh, dear excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a great pleasure seeing you and welcome to our second panel which is called Anti-Corruption Policy Implementations, New Instruments for Engagement and Impact. Um, as you can see, I, I think without a shadow of a doubt, you would agree with me that I'm a very lucky lady surrounded by this fine gentleman. So I wish you all to uh, enjoy the session as much as I will. And uh, maybe just see in a nutshell, what are we going to discuss in this, in this panel today? Corruption risk assessment is a, is a diagnostic tool which is used by public bodies to to identify and prevent the most prevalent and, and damaging, dangerous corruption and uh, conflict of interest schemes in, at the institutional, sectoral, and also local levels. So our current session will delve in, into the details and delve into the existing state of corruption risk assessment. And we will try to, to figure out, we will try to see how to make things better practically how to upgrade corruption risk assessment so that it can turn into a systematic structure and a more, more uh, continuous process. And of course, we will, we will focus here on the uh, vulnerabilities of public bodies, mm, including information security, public procurement, administrative charges, etc., etc. But let me not hijack the panel and uh, just start with my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Alexander Gerganov. He is the, the, the director of the sociological program at the Center for the Study of Democracy. Uh, he has a great, great contribution in the fight against corruption. He has actually contributed methodol methodologically to the uh, update of the implementation of the corruption monitoring system which uh, I, I am sure you know is a set of indicators which are, which are employed, used by the European Commission uh, in their regular Eurobarometer. Uh, in addition to this, Dr. Gerganov is also an assistant professor at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. And let me just finish here. Thank you, and the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Vanya, uh, for the kind words and for the introduction. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, uh, thank you for your patience to attend this second panel, which I believe uh, is not easy uh, after the impressive first panel to keep your interest uh, for these more practical tools. So we already heard about the good political will that is present in the fight against corruption. And now we will move uh, on to more practical instruments. We will zoom in to how to advance this uh, fight against corruption. And it is my pleasure to present to you briefly some of the instruments that the Center for the Study of Democracy has developed uh, uh, during the past three decades. Uh, and uh, I will start with the corruption monitoring system that Vanya mentioned. And since uh, I don't want to be too technical, I will focus more on the history and on the lessons learned. Uh, it was said during the, per uh, the first panel that uh, lessons learned means uh, an euphemism for uh, that we have not advanced in any way in the fight against corruption. I wouldn't completely agree with that. I think that uh, we can also learn from positive examples and I hope I can give some uh, s such positive examples. Uh, so the corruption monitoring system, we started this in the late 90s. And in the late 90s, corruption assessment was driven by uh, perceptions of corruption. So this was what dominated the corruption assessment field. And the problem with corruption perceptions was that when we try to communicate this to policymakers, to, uh, to politicians, to the administration, they said, okay, these are perceptions, but perceptions are not always true. And in our case, they are not true. Corruption does not exist in our organization. Corruption does not exist in our country, no matter what the perceptions say. And in a sense, it was very difficult to argue with that because we know that when there is a corruption case and the media are free and they can operate freely and they delve into cases of corruption unravel, uh, corruption scandals, uh, this actually creates the impression among people that corruption is proliferating very actively. So if you have free media that expose corruption, people say, oh, look how corrupt this is. And this was mentioned during the first session that uh, it is very difficult to fight with disinformation. Uh, it is very difficult to uh, educate people how to understand how to treat, cor treat corruption. So. Uh, when this argument was given that perceptions are not necessarily facts, we wanted to have a stronger argument uh, in our communication with uh, policymakers and the administration. And uh, in our view at the time, corruption was like an elephant in the room that everyone was denying to see. Uh, and uh, we uh, started with introducing some indicators that measured not perception but actual experiences. So what we did was introducing the corruption monitoring system and here you can see uh, some data that I will not go into. I am just showing this as background to what I will tell you. So these data start from the early, uh, begin from the beginning of the century, from 2001, and even earlier in Bulgaria from 2000, even there was a survey in 1999. And uh, here we actually tapped into the citizens' experiences. And this particular indicator, corruption pressure, it reflects the percentage of people who report being asking directly or indirectly for a bribe in some form in the year preceding the survey. So these are actually percentages. And uh, when we introduced this, it was very difficult for uh, policymakers and for the administration to ignore this because we said, okay, you say that there is no administrative corruption, that pu public officials do not take any bribes, that there are very few cases of 
actual people who are reported, who are prosecuted. And then we showed this data and we said, look at what the people are reporting in an anonymous survey. 20%, 30% or more of the people, they uh, report actually experiencing this themselves. And this is how we started this corruption monitoring system. Of course, we had other indicators to about uh, attitudes. Uh, some We kept some of the indicators about perceptions because, of course, this is also important, how people trust or distrust governments, how they perceive the policy uh, makers, the government and everything. Uh, but this is our most important indicator and uh, m probably, Ten years later, this was adopted in the Euro, uh, in the Eurobarometer on corruption, uh, where uh, some of our questions were adapted, and uh, this became uh, an EU EU-wide exercise to monitor this. I think biannually, and other instruments also included experiences in in their in in their toolset. So we changed a bit the measurement of corruption and uh, with time the dialogue with policymakers also changed. They admitted that there is an elephant. However, they focused only on the elephant eggs or uh, legs or, or tail or a small part of the elephant. They, they said, okay, uh, we admit that there is administrative corruption, but it is at the lowest level. It is just public officials who take small bribes, uh, they take uh, uh, 10 euro, and uh, we will fight this with, with all our strength. And uh, this was good. This improved the dialogue. However, uh, then we uh, all again was the bigger picture. Again, didn't see the whole elephant because it was not only about the administrative corruption. It was about the high-level high corruption as well. And you will see that with uh, time, there is some progress in some of the countries. At least in the beginning, there was. Uh, Mr. Shentov mentioned this that uh, in in the late uh, in. Uh, uh, around, uh, let's say, uh, the, in, in the first decade of the century, there was some uh, period when administrative corruption was quite low. Uh, however, uh, high-level corruption continued to take place, and we even had some evidence that uh, it proliferated even, even more. And uh, at some moment, we even had the feeling that administrative corruption is not so much uh, curbed uh, down, but rather that it was captured, that uh, this was not lucrative enough uh, to let uh, low-level public officials take their small bribes and everyone, everything was centralized. And then we started working on this concept of state capture, which uh, came to address uh, one very interesting uh, thing we were observing in our corruption mo monitoring system. Even when actual experiences uh, of corruption were declining, the perceptions of citizens about how feasible the fight towards corruption is they were not improving. So people experienced less corruption than before. However, they said that, uh, uh, that corruption uh, cannot really be countered through policy responses because the politicians were corrupt. And uh, uh, they were, uh, people were losing trust in the government. So uh, we started focusing on measuring this much harder thing, the high level corruption we developed the concept of state capture, uh, which uh, is not simply high-level corruption. It is a quite complicated uh, concept. Uh, some of us think that it is not even corruption at all, but a separate phenomenon. And this is why we talk about capturing the state, about state capture. We don't simply uh, think that it is the same as high-level corruption because high-level corruption 
uh, we can talk about uh, clientelism, we can uh, talk about uh, individual cases of high level corruption, we can talk about resilience at the high level. Uh, however, state capture is actually privatizing the functions of the government for uh, private, ben private benefit. And this is something uh, I don't remember if I have the definition here, but you can see it in our publications. I will give you a list of the most important one related to state capture later. Uh, we uh, actually think that it is a separate phenomenon that is uh, privatizing the, the, go the government functions. It is it is using, it can use uh, whole institutions and their functions for private gain. So this is systemic. This is not simply a high level corruption. It is a systemic issue. So we try to uh, build a theoretical model that explains what this is. And we try to come up with some metrics to show rather the symptoms and the risk uh, for this to take place because uh, as you know, corruption is deeply hidden and high level corruption is especially difficult to expose on a, when it is on a systemic basis. If an, even if you expose a particular case, this doesn't tell you much about the magnitude of the problem, about how proliferated this is. So we, we tried through proxies to uh, measure this and we had uh, good success with this. We pilot this in several countries, in Italy, Bulgaria. Uh, uh, then we did it again, uh, adding Spain, Romania. And here you can see some data about the Balkans because the Balkans are our, let's say, putri dish where we uh, can study uh, really well how corruption takes place, how state capture takes place. I wouldn't call it a Disneyland because Disneyland naturally gives uh, positive uh, uh, associations, uh, but I will mention at the end about this comparison of corruption to different things. Uh, now you can see some examples of our uh, SCAT, uh, State Capture Assessment Diagnostics indicators for uh, six Balkan countries. And there is, of course, uh, for Bulgaria as well. Uh, and what we try to do is zoom in beyond the level of countries. So usually these uh, uh, indicators and indexes, they focus on countries and they rank countries and then we uh, create an anti-corruption agency uh, five times uh, again and again and uh, uh, this doesn't seem very productive. What we wanted to do is zoom in and show particular uh, risks. And in this case, these are particular state capture risks where we show uh, monopolization of the sectors that could be potentially related to state capture influences. And of course, there is much intertwined uh, in this. There is organized crime, there is illicit financial flows. Uh, there is a lot uh, ongoing uh, behind this, but uh, what we were trying to do is to have some numbers that help us focus on a particular sector in a particular country because uh, these sectors are not the same for all the countries. Uh, we all know sectors like construction or pharma that are notoriously uh, risky, uh, however, or energy. However, things are not the same for, for all the countries. And, uh, Moreover, how do we know when we have progress in a particular area? How can we see this? How can we measure this? This is uh, an instrument that we uh, conceived in order to do this. And this is an instrument that tried to shift again the dialogue to seeing the whole elephant, to seeing the whole corruption pro problem. It's not just about the traffic policeman who took uh, 10 euros. This is not the problem. The problem is corruption and the problem is building resilient institutions. And 
continuing uh, this process because uh, somehow people think that we can do this one-time exercise, find the correct person, the correct leader who will solve this problem once and for all. This is not the case. Uh, countries that have uh, strong democratic and resilient to corruption institutions, they've built these institutions for hundreds of years. We cannot do this for three years or for five years. We need to continue this, and for this we need monitoring. And uh, these are some of our publications that you can see on our webpage. And uh, I encourage you to read them and ask questions if they are too technical or too complicated, and then reach out to us to continue this conversation in more detail because there is a lot of technical stuff under hood and uh, I'm just focusing on the, let's say, the bigger picture. And this is how our, our conversation went. At some point, it was admitted that there is an elephant. And today we talked about the elephant, uh, it, especially in our first panel. And now the question became, okay, uh, we admit that there is an elephant in the room, we can kind of see it, but what do we do about it? Tell us what to do. And we couldn't simply say, okay, form another uh, uh, anti-corruption agency. Uh, we, we had to come up with something more concrete and what we came up with was this instrument, monitoring anti-corruption policy implementation that we call MACP, and this instrument, it operates at the level of public organizations. And the idea here is to target administrative corruption at the level where it actually takes place, at the level of public organizations. And you can see that this has been implemented already in more than 12 countries in various kinds of institutions. And so far we had overwhelmingly good uh, feedback on this, that it is really, really useful. And these are the small steps that could be taken to improve this uh, situation, to improve the resilience of particular public organizations. And when we are asked, okay, what to do about the elephant, we come up with this suggestion, and this suggestion is often actually used, and people are happy with it. And uh, uh, you can see here that there are different groups of uh, uh, participants in this because when a new instrument is created, of course there is always the attempt to uh, go around it somehow, to use the instrument in a way that it shows the uh, best pos possible results and we have built this uh, with the idea that this will happen and so far it went uh, very well for the past uh, seven or eight years and uh, this is a tool that the idea is to uh, do it periodically to improve things and to monitor things it doesn't measure uh, actual corruption levels it shows a public organization where their vulnerabilities are uh, and where they should focus and this is uh, this makes the dialogue much easier because it is very difficult to have a dialogue starting with you know how corrupt you are what are you going to do about it so this is actually uh, starting the dialogue with okay this is how you fight corruption and this is good but this is the way to improve things and this is more or less how we see uh, things that uh, uh, how we see uh, things that should uh, take place when this instrument is used, uh, uh, let's say annually or biannually, and there are some organizations uh, like, for example, in Bulgaria, Traffic Police and Border Police that have already done this uh, uh, periodically three times in both organizations in the Bulgarian uh, National Revenue Agency. This has been implemented, and it is doing what is uh, its intention is. And to wrap things up, since I'm probably abusing my time now uh, a bit, and Vanya is kind enough not to uh, mention this, but uh, I know it, I will finish uh, with uh, this old story uh, since I've been comparing uh, corruption to an elephant. So you know corruption has been com 
compared to a disease, to, uh, to war, to various things. I like comparing it to an elephant because this is all, this, there is this old saying, how do we eat an elephant? And you, of course you know the answer, it's one bite at a time. And this is what our instruments uh, help policymakers and public administration do. Eat the elephant one bite at a time. And I hope we have a uh, fruitful panel discussing how to cook the elephant. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Vanya, for the floor. I return it. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Great. Uh, I really like your uh, metaphor about uh, eating the whole elephant or seeing the whole elephant in the room. I think we should probably tweak it a little bit and start talking about the bear and the dragon in the room. But uh, anyways, uh, I already have a few questions for you, but let's see how we're doing with time and then we will jump in with questions. Please, if you have any questions, keep them in mind. This, uh, this applies also to our uh, viewers online. Hello to you too. And let's just uh, give the floor to you. <laughs> so this is my this is my dear friend Mishi, uh, Dr. Mihali Fazekash. He's an associate professor at the Central European University, um, the School of Public Policy, and he's uh, specializing in employing big data to to figure out how to fight corruption and to figure out um, good governance on a global level. Additionally, he also serves as the, as the research director of a innovative policy think tank. This is the Government uh, Transparency Institute. And he's also advocating for employing new techniques, new methodologies, and also big data in, in his work. So please, Mishi, we are all eyes and ears. Go ahead. Thanks a lot. Um, can I have the... The pointer. So let me put it on the table uh, right in the beginning. I'm not into the business of eating elephants okay. if, on dragons, um, but yes, I, I understand the point. And let me try to show you a different lens at, uh, at seeing various um, exotic um, animals. So I will um, talk about um, our results in this uh, project, so the, the project funded by the Norway, uh, Iceland, and uh, Liechtenstein Fund. Um, I will, great, so I will talk about a general risk assessment tool, opentender.eu. This is something which was originally uh, created uh, from uh, EU funding, um, Horizon 2020 at the time, and then we at the, the Government Transparency Institute have been uh, maintaining it since then, and also partially thanks to the Norway funds, we could extend it. So now Serbia is also part of it, North Macedonia is also part of it, and for many of the countries uh, of this project, we, we could add uh, uh, more recent data and we could um, enrich the risk assessment methodologies. Then in the second part of my uh, uh, short presentation, I will apply this data this approach, such methodologies, to the problem of political favoritism in local uh, public spending, in particular public procurement on the local level. I will not waste time on convincing you that public procurement is a risk uh, area for corruption and it's a problematic area from a lot of different perspectives. I assume that we are all on board with this um, statement. So first, opentender.eu. So this is uh, an, an online analytics portal, free to use, free to download the data. It is designed to make otherwise complex, hard to work with public procurement data more um, transparent, more easily analyzable, and catering to various analytical de uh, needs and demands. It allows you to do basic analytics, just looking at trends over time, uh, looking at distributions of the different risk factors, but also allows you to do more advanced analytics, uh, benchmarking functionalities, disaggregating different risk profiles for organizations and digging uh, deeper into what uh, uh, the, the different risk areas are for various um, organizations, markets, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so this is our uh, country coverage. We have over 50 million tenders on the portal, mainly going back to the mid-2000s. And then, as I said, uh, North Macedonia and Serbia uh, has been uh, added uh, thanks to the project and we would have liked to add more countries but there are a couple of countries in the Western Balkans region which still don't have 
uh, good enough e-procurement uh, uh, portal, which would allow us to, to tap into this, um, I would say, uh, fairly useful data. Now, the portal allows you to look at market analytics, integrity, transparency. So what we really firmly believe in that we shouldn't just talk about how much corruption there is. That's not the right conversation. We want to talk about cost of corruption. That's why, for example, I was very happy to, or well, happy maybe it's not the good word, but I very much agreed with Laura Kovacs' example that corruption does have serious consequences. It's not just about money. It's about lives. It's about uh, how, we, uh, how our democracies function, so on and so forth. So we link market analytics with integrity, okay? So violating integrity, uh, um, expectations and standards, corruption risks do cost us uh, a lot of money, do distort uh, markets, uh, allocation of public resources, allocation of um, private resources across uh, companies. So really, there are uh, serious uh, costs uh, to that. So let me move on to applying this. It is far more interesting, I think, than just uh, uh, talking about the website, but of course, you know, feel free to, to, to jump on your phone and, and visit it. Okay, so what did we look at in the third uh, good governance report of this project? Um, one of the main areas uh, was uh, political favoritism in municipal spending. So the issue is, the underlying issue is that we expect public contracts to go where public demand is, you know, serving the public good rather than for serving political interests. Okay, so we pay taxes, that goes into the budget, that money gets allocated to municipalities, and we expect this money to go where publicly uh, announced, openly and transparently uh, announced uh, needs are defined. Okay, so if there is a flood somewhere, we want the flood fund to go there. Okay, we don't want the flood fund to go to a uh, municipality where the mayor happens to be uh, aligned with the central government, right? irrespective of floods, right? I mean, this happens in some countries. So. Uh, the underlying problem is that our taxpayers' money doesn't follow public good, but follows political interest, private uh, political parties' interest. So what we try to do is to understand the scale of this problem, the nature of this problem, and try to unpack it uh, in the nine uh, uh, Southeast European countries of the project. We did uh, hard-nosed quantitative analysis. I will use some uh, statistical terms. I apologize for that already in advance. But we also did some nice uh, case studies backing up those uh, systemic findings so that you see that what we find is not just some fluke in the data, but really the uh, corresponds to the day-to-day -day experiences of uh, a lot of uh, people. Okay. So what kind of factors did we use in the analysis? What uh, did we look at? So we looked at two main predictors or determinants of uh, uh, politically motivated public spending. On the one hand, we looked at political alignment between the local and the central level. Okay, so we look at who is in uh, government uh, in the central level. Okay, so which party or coalition of parties govern the country. And we looked at the party of the mayor on the municipal level or the, the party of the, the dominant coalition in the, in the local council. So that's called alignment, okay? If they belong to the same party, the local and the central level, they are aligned. If they don't belong to the same party, so say the local level has the opposition party running the municipality, then it's not uh, aligned with the central government. The second factor we looked at is winning margin, okay? So by how much percent uh, the winning uh, mayor or a winning party in the local level has won. If this margin is small, this is an uncertain municipality, okay? So then it's from a political calculus perspective, you don't know what will be the outcome. If someone wins by 1% uh, or 2% point, then it was a really uncertain uh, a local election. If the winning margin is 20, 30%, that's a done deal. You know, months before the local elections, you know what's going to happen, okay? So these are political factors, alignment as well as winning margin. They should have no effect on where public money, taxpayers' money goes, right? That's one of the foundations of Brazilian democracies is that we separate uh, political parties' money from taxpayers' government money, okay? So we expect zero relationship. It's very important. If a government uh, and a democracy works well, these factors should have no effect on uh, public procurement spending. So public procurement spending, we looked at uh, the data from open tender and we basically aggregated total spending for each municipality. 
Okay, so we say, okay, uh, municipality of Skopje or municipality of you know, XYZ will spend this amount of euros in this year. Okay, and then these are um, you know, logarithmic scale because this is a very skewed distribution, but basically you could see that roughly normally distributed spending patterns uh, across um, these countries. And here is the main slide with our main results. You might not recognize that this is a shocking slide. It is. It is because we expect all these dots and the confidence bars around them to be aligned on zero, okay? If democracy works, if democracy separates political parties from public taxpayers' money, then there is no relationship between the alignment of uh, the municipal administration and central government and the amount of spending. Now, every single country, with, with the ex exception of Albania, has a significant effect here. We have Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania, where loyalty pays, okay? That's, that's the kind of uh, shorthand for this. If a municipality is aligned with the central government, then it receives uh, 30 to 50% more public procurement spending in the years of alignment, okay? About half more money you get, if you share political uh, 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 party affiliation on the local level with the central government. That's very bad news. And you know, indeed, we have quotes from various countries, including Hungary and also some other countries, where politicians go out and campaign, like, vote for me because I get you money from the central government. Well, this is the kind of thing you shouldn't say on the record because it's not for you to decide that taxpayers' money will support your local uh, political campaign, okay? We separate political parties from taxpayers' money, from government money. So when a politician is going out and says it openly that this is the reason you should vote for me, and then we see the systematic evidence, we are in trouble. Now we have some other countries, you might have noticed, North Macedonia, Croatia, and Serbia, where the association is negative. That's a bit surprising, but not too much if you think about it. It's, uh, it is uh, expressing another pattern where the central government is trying to buy allegiance from opposition municipalities, okay? You're not with me, but I give you money if you behave in this and this way. Again, the story, what's happening behind these uh, coefficients, we know from case studies, okay? So in the cases when non-aligned uh, municipalities get more money, it basically shows uh, an instrument for the central government to control these, even if the, politically they are misaligned. So this is either way uh, bad news. I might tell you that Albania, the effect is insignificant, so it's good news, but um, unfortunately that's due to the low number of uh, municipalities in the sample. So even there, I would argue that the pattern is closer to Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania. So the second aspect uh, of uh, uh, risk uh, for uh, uh, political favoritism in uh, local spending was linked to winning margin. Okay, so here the political calculus is again relatively straightforward. If I can trust that this municipality will be on my side after elections, do I give them more money or less? Well, if uh, political logic was separated from uh, public budgets, then there should be no relationship. Instead, what we see in Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania is that, uh, is that, um, yes, uh, well, let me go back is that when winning margin is higher, we have higher public procurement uh, spending in these municipalities. So what does it mean? It means if you're aligned with the central government and you are reliably aligned, then you get even more money, okay? So that's basically not only loyalty pays, but reliable loyalty pays. And that's, you know, it's double, double bad news for, you know, places like uh, Hungary, Albania, uh, Romania, and, and Serbia, where we found some uh, significant um, effects here. We also have some uh, cases where, um, where uh, there was no relationship between uh, uh, electoral uncertainty, so winning margin, and uh, public procurement spending. This is where we are you know, relatively happy. This is what we expected uh, uh, under normal democratic conditions. Now, let's try to bring these two sides together relatively quickly. So alignment and uh, winning margin or electoral uncertainty. So in Hungary, Romania, and Albania, to, to various degrees, but more or less um, following the same pattern, 
it is uh, alignment and reliable alignment pays. So that's where public, federal, or national budgets go where uh, al alignment is strong and reliable. We have Croatia, North Macedonia, and, and Serbia, where non-aligned municipalities re receive more funds, and then the, the winning margin effect is relatively uh, weak. Okay, so it's really about the outcome of the elections, not uh, whether we can predict those uh, election uh, outcomes. And then Bulgaria is, is a sort of uh, category on its own. It might be uh, a funny statement uh, sitting in Bulgaria, but here aligned, uh, aligned uh, localities receive more uh, spending irrespective of electoral uh, competitiveness. So what follows from this, right? So what follows from this is that there is strong evidence for politically motivated distribution of public uh, uh, investment funds, public procurement funds, that largely follows political party alignment, but also there is some evidence that the uh, intent to influence electoral outcomes and the reflections on electoral uncertainty influences um, um, uh, public procurement uh, allocations. So what can we do with this, right? I mean, it's one thing to say things are bad, and probably in this room I wouldn't shock uh, many people that corruption is a, is a, is a big problem in, in the region. So one thing, and maybe this is something interesting for the European Commission, this is relatively easy to monitor, right? So we can look at uh, these politically motivated uh, central local transfers because the data is out there. All you need to do is to cross party affiliation with budgetary transfers on an annual basis. It's not super easy, but it can be done because the data is available for all EU member states, for all, all accession countries. So that's my simple and relatively selfish advocation for more research and more analysis, but I think um, uh, if, you, if you are with me with these findings, it, this, this makes sense. The second aspect is what to do about it, right? So first we need to improve uh, transparency, we need to improve the amount of data available for, for civil society, for businesses, so on and so forth. We have uh, a couple of concrete uh, recommendations here and I was very happy to, to listen to the, the newly elected mayor of Sofia who indeed uh, put forward quite a few recommendations uh, along these uh, lines. And then the final recommendation is that which received relatively little uh, attention, but we need to increase oversight of this allocation formula, of these allocation decisions. Who decides on how much investment money goes from municipality A versus municipality, municipality B? Was there an open call for municipalities to apply for these funds? Or if the formula is there, is it a clear and transparent formula or easy to manipulate? Okay, well, even if there was an open call for municipalities, was this uh, decision committee which decided on these allocation uh, questions, was it independent, was it uh, politically balanced, so on and so forth. These are straightforward things we can check, these are th very straightforward things we can demand, and hopefully if they are together implemented, so transparency, independence of these decisions, re greater reliance on formula funding as opposed to uh, uh, discretionary decisions, this should limit. I'm not uh, you know, naive here, I don't think we can eliminate this, and I'm actually worried about how these charts would look like places like Germany or Belgium. I would love to do that sort of research, but the point is we should limit, we should control the scale of these uh, politically motivated uh, uh, public uh, allocations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michi. Uh, fascinating presentations. I, I already have a few questions for you and a few observations. Let me just, just two, three sentences and then we move on to Misha. Um, I completely agree with your observation then that there is a critical need for more research and more study in this area. I particularly work on uh, trying to estimate the uh, illicit financial inflows and outflows in our region and I can confirm with you that this is a particularly severely understudied topic. And actually we were, uh, uh, we at the Center for the Study of Democracy, we were mm, doing something very similar to, to, to the research you were sharing. Uh, in the last few months we were trying to, to see what is the uh, effect of uh, elections and, and uh, political alignment of mayors and municipalities on the transfers, so, so transfers from the central budget to the municipal budgets. 
And it, 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 was, it was a quite interesting, uh, very straightforward actually research, si similar design as yours, um, di difference in difference. Uh, but the main problem there we are facing is that is the lack of data actually. We really couldn't get any data on the, uh, especially on trans, so on especially some of the Western Balkan countries, we really cannot get the data for um, all the municipalities. So this is also a, a big, big issue. It's uh, the need to be studied, but also we, the crucial need for more quality and quantity data. Let me, uh, let's, let's go ahead. My other dear friend, uh, Misha Popovic. So Misha Popovic is a research uh, coordinator uh, at the Institute for Democracy Skopje. He's also good governance program coordinator. And his efforts ha have uh, made substantial contribution in the realms of um, political participation, political culture in North Macedonia. And he was one of the key um, advocates in reshaping the anti-corruption commission in North Macedonia. And also he was one of the main uh, people involved in drafting the new anti-corruption law back in, I think, 2018, right? So, um, Misha, go ahead, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Vanya, and thanks for the uh, opportunity to, uh, to speak at this uh, conference. I'll not, I'm not going to present uh, a new uh, tool as uh, Alexander and uh, Mikhali were uh, already uh, basically opened the, the discussion, particularly Alexander mentioning uh, MACPI as that's the corruption risk assessment uh, tool that we have been implementing uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, various projects uh, throughout the years. Uh, but I'll give uh, <coughs> basically a short reflection on uh, how this uh, tool uh, is or is not implemented and what are the possibilities to use it and, 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 uh, and how uh, in, in the Western Balkans and particularly in uh, North Macedonia. So one, uh, and, I'll, and I'll focus a, a little bit given that the, the, the latest report by the, by the project is concerned with uh, local government and, and tra transfers between uh, central government and local government and political favoritism. I'll focus on just presenting one of the problems uh, and how local administration is imagining anti-corruption. Uh, uh, so basically, if you look at the data from the state capture assessment diagnostics, the latest round done in 2020, but I think that some of the kind of vulnerabilities is uh, are, have, have actually grown since 2020. Uh, we see that, for instance, activities or, or uh, areas of government uh, where local, gover uh, local governments have mandate uh, have some level of vulnerability and particularly to one of the measurements in the state capture uh, assessment diagnostics and that's the private interest bias and that's basically how much uh, regulators, agencies, institutions that are there to protect uh, uh, rule of law, public interest and compliance to, to norms uh, by different operators, particularly in the, in the economy, are capable or, uh, or are, are actually prone to serve the interest of, of these private uh, entities. And you see, in, in one, in the, in the first row, there, there is some vulnerability that is diagnosed for local government, government uh, governments. Uh, but you also, in, in, in the Western Balkan countries, you see that, for instance, other areas of governance are also a mandate of the local uh, government, particularly uh, construction and particularly environmental protection and procurement as well. So in these areas, uh, we see vulnerability, which is expected. But thanks to the state capture uh, di diagnostics, we have numbers and we can monitor it longitudinally when, when this is reapplied. So basically, I mean, there is an understanding and an agreement that local governments are at risk for uh, 
corruption, as of course. But, uh, and I'm talking mostly about North Macedonia, but you can see this paradigm elsewhere, is that at some point, corruption risk assessment and integrity policies have conflated. And in some way, integrity poli policies became more about human resource integrity rather than structural integrity uh, and integrity of institutions and their processes uh, within. So we see, for instance, in local governments in North Macedonia, uh, particular focus on imagining anti-corruption policies as uh, human resource problems. So the solutions are train, train the people train the civil ser servants and everything will be okay because if there is there are no rotten apples in the public service at local level then we won't have a uh, problem of uh, of uh, corruption uh, but this is actually not uh, a particularly useful way of uh, approaching anti-corruption uh, uh, policy uh, policy development in the in the context of the of the region and uh, in the con context of the institutional maturity of uh, of the institutions uh, so aside from negative professional socialization and and basically even those uh, good people that enter uh, public uh, service are getting socialized uh, negatively uh, we see uh, an abundance of vulnerabilities that lie elsewhere from the human uh, problem in not enough procedures, uh, not enough oversight uh, and control mechanisms embedded within institutional uh, functioning. Uh, so this actually under, uh, uh, underpins the understanding that we need to add something more rather than focusing on uh, integrity policies and ethics uh, codes in the in the public uh, uh, sir, uh, in the public service also uh, we see a growing trend uh, where uh, institutional uh, anti-corruption policies are being siloed so uh, this is uh, in seeing that the, the anti-corruption policies are, are kind of separate of reaching uh, particular uh, legally mandated goals of uh, institutions. So uh, strategic uh, goals, action plans uh, for, uh, I don't know, advancing some uh, areas of the work of, of the institutions, let's say uh, fight against uh, organized crime, is being separated by, uh, uh, is, is seen as separate uh, from uh, a particular institutional anti-corruption uh, policy. So anti-corruption policies are dominantly being developed as uh, in, in, the, in terms of institutional growth rather than achieving the core business uh, goals of, uh, of the institutions. So uh, this kind of focus on human uh, resources is also based on uh, the, the, the idea that changing values will solve things, but that's although true. Uh, it's a long-term process, so corruption risk assessments become uh, one of the tools that kind of can provide uh, uh, better um, short-term uh, 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 solutions. So, uh, so corruption risk assessments uh, uh, Basically, uh, and, and, and if, if we look at the MACP2, uh, the Monitoring Anti-Corruption Policy Implementation tool, is understanding that, uh, is understanding the institution uh, that it has a certain actions and activities to, uh, to do, and we should check how many of those activities are under risk of corruption, what type of corruption is threatening this, uh, activities and how much of uh, of anti-corruption policies are there to prevent that risk actually uh, uh, materializing. So uh, one is that uh, basically, uh, sorry, uh, so corruption risk assessments can shift this so, and, and MACP as a tool can shift this 
uh, to add focus on processes rather than only human uh, uh, training. So this paradigm shift is then uh, build, is focused, it becomes focusing on, on building resilience to the workflow of the institution immediately rather than uh, setting up uh, goals for uh, improving values within the uh, civil uh, service. Uh, so, when applying actually uh, corruption risk assessments in practice, you face uh, one one thing, and uh, and let's borrow uh, the animal metaphors that we started uh, talking about. Uh, institutions acknowledge that there is an elephant uh, in the room, uh, and they usually imagine their anti-corruption policies as uh, integrity policies, so training of their of their people. But then, when you go inside and apply corruption risk assessment, and you see whether their existing anti-corruption policies are efficient in, uh, and provide enough coverage to decrease the risks that particular activities of the institutions can be reached without corruption happening. Uh, there is a can of worms that is opened, uh, and you see that uh, there is low effectiveness uh, of, of uh, anti-corruption policies, low implementation, particularly uh, analysis of how of sanctioning uh, uh, notable infringements, uh, or to use uh, uh, a more recent uh, metaphor. Uh, when you go uh, in, with the, uh, and enter an institution's institution, sorry, and do a corruption risk assessment, you see all the bed bugs coming from the uh, from the uh, from the duvet. Uh, so, uh, so this is when you start actually helping by ba based on evidence uh, a particular institution trying to solve problems now, start solving problems now, because you identify not only how to train people, but which particular anti-corruption policies are not efficient, and, and more often than not, uh, whether some activities do not even have anti-corruption policies uh, in place that protect uh, the, the institution from, uh, uh, from corruption. Uh, sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, so, uh, l lastly, uh, one uh, area of applying corruption risk assessment is uh, is uh, basically cooperating with uh, the institutions and uh, working uh, uh, working your way towards uh, uh, developing a, a real anti-corruption uh, plan. Uh, but, on the other hand, uh, corruption risk assessments are, uh, uh, an can, can be an important uh, advocacy tool, particularly in cases when, when there is controversy in society and a particular institution becomes involved in, uh, uh, in a controversy. So, uh, we see that during controversy, but at the same time existing political, at least nominal political will to fight uh, corruption, there is a space of orga for organized civil society and media to demand diagnostics in a particular institution. Uh, and uh, in this way, uh, you kind of use these uh, small windows of opportunity, sm small openings, to enter and work with institutions because there is hesitance, to be honest, by institutions to do corruption risk assessment, to uh, open and have trust enough for some external uh, researcher to enter and uh, uh, do this uh, diagnostic uh, uh, tools. So, uh, this, uh, this demand for diagnostic uh, can, be, can be used by civil society because uh, politicians will want to uh, at least uh, uh, create a perception that they are willing to, sh to solve a problem and 
teaching civil society and, and particularly media on what to kind of focus on when building uh, public uh, uh, demand is, is uh, useful for, uh, for actually gaining access to these uh, uh, institutions. So I'll end here and uh, yes, and I'm open for questions. Perfect. Thank you, Misha. It was really super interesting. It, uh, what comes to my mind is that we seems like we're the panel of metaphors. Everyone comes with a better and better metaphor. So, uh, la la last but not least, <laughs> now you have the the task, you know, of coming coming with with another metaphor. Killing the killing the last before the lamp. This is the real challenge. So. Uh, uh, hold on. <laughs> I'm trying to catch up time. Well, one second. No, we, but do we, your introduction. We, yeah, yeah. Do my introduction and then g g give me, give me two minutes. Uh, and, and we started late, so take it easy. We, I think we, we can abuse the time a little bit, right? Five minutes, five minutes, and then everyone's starving. I know. Uh, let me attract your attention to Angelos Binis. I, I think all of my panelists don't really need that much of. Uh, um, discussion about their CVs and but I, let me let me just say so uh, he is a sen uh, seasoned policy researcher with a comprehensive background in anti-corruption policies non-profit organizations and also policy analysis um, after working at the organization for economic cooperation and development in 2019 he was appointed as the first governor of the Greek National Transparency uh, authority. Then in 2022, he joined Frontex as the agency head of internal, um, uh, aud uh, internal audit. Yes. yes, and presently, presently he, he works at the European Commission's uh, DG reform and he, he's supporting countries in implementing hands-on anti-corruption and good governance reforms. Uh, we decided here to break the mold a little bit, so we will not keep on with the presentation, but it will be more like a, in a form of discussion. So um, I have a few questions for you, Please. or maybe if you want, you can uh, just say a few sentences and then I will kick up with my... With let's proceed with the questions right away. Please. Okay, right. Let, let's, let's proceed with the questions right away. So you, you have such an extensive experience. You have national experience and you also have the EU experience. And as, as a head of uh, a strong anti national anti-corruption authority, I was wondering, it will be really interesting for you to share with us, what are the key cornerstones and elements of an effective whole of government uh, anti-corruption strategy and reform. So thanks for the invitation. Allow me to complement the discussion with some hands-on approach on how we can do corruption risk assessment management and practitioners tool. So if we look from inside the government, what all these researchers would like to see would be solid corruption risk registers in every organization, not at least the big ones. I mean, does the municipality of Sofia has a corruption risk register, which I can look into? and see whether they have the right controls in place and how we can help them. If not, coming someone from outside and doing a research, it's useful, but it's not so practical. What I need is to see, why doesn't the municipality of Sofia does framework contracts? Most likely they don't have the capacity to do so because they're not trained. So if you don't do framework contracts, there's opportunity for fraud and corruption. But we must have, if we were a risk management focus group now, I would have a table talk to you and map the risks. Insufficient training on dynamic purchasing agreements or framework contracts. Then processes are bureaucratic. Paper-wise, someone can miss a paper. If it was fully digitalized, this couldn't happen because there would be an audit trail. And many, many examples, but mapping down the risks. Talking about risk assessment in theory and with the PPT, it's good for a conference and maybe a PhD, but not for the real life. So first point, strong institution. Every country must have a strong institution providing guidance and training on a continuous basis on how government institutions can conduct meaningful risk assessments. The discussion should be up to the level of the Council of Ministers, not wishful thinking, let's have a risk assessment once in a while. 
every quarter at the Council of Ministers. Minister of Agriculture, where is your risk assessment? Lots of money, lots of risks, no one is looking at them. You don't have your risk assessment? Sorry, there's a problem with your ministry. Second, law. This should be, especially in continental Europe, we're not Anglo-Saxon, not only Balkans, most of the European Union countries. Corruption risk management, risk management overall enterprise, but let's focus on corruption, is not mandatory. So whoever is doing it is on a voluntary basis, mostly for political and research-wise reasons. And third, strong monitoring. And here is where NGOs, researchers could pay uh, could play a, a, a very significant role. Come in, take a sample, and see whether these corruption risk assessments, these risk registers are, tick the box. I've seen a lot. I've worked with 332 municipalities. The one was copying the other. It was not, it was not a real corruption risk assessment. They were just ticking the box. Do you have your corruption risk assessment? Yes, of course. No one was looking at the quality. So, second point, personalization. We can sit here and write the perfect long corruption risk assessment at the government institution. Every institution with more than 50 FTEs and a budget with more than 100, 1 million and having more than 10 procurements every year should make two corruption risk assessments. And we would copy Sapin 2 and all the rest, perfecto. And then we would give it to authorities, 1,700 authorities in the member state, do your corruption risk assessment. They will not. Because no one will train them, no one will monitor the quality, no one will be there both to push and motivate and empower. So this big reform will fail. DG Reform Commission will pay 2 million euros to someone to write the perfect book, maybe Michal or someone else. And then another addition to our library, or if, if the table is not very stable, we can put it underneath if it's big enough and heavy enough. Third, whole of society, NGOs, private sector. Don't be afraid of what the private sector is doing. Private sector and corruption risk assessment are strong. You know why? Because if the, if the risk materializes, they pay. When they pay, there is pain. It's not like the municipality or the ministry. When you, the, the risk materializes and you pay, there is no pain. Somebody pays. Who? The taxpayer. Who knows the taxpayer? But the owner of the company, if a corruption risk materializes, fragmentation of procurement, photographic procurement, it will cost, and he doesn't like to pay the owner. This is the difference. The watchdogs could go in and see whether and make may maybe observatory, blame and shame. Okay, this municipality is doing a very good job, corruption risk assessment, process-based, photographic, why? No framework contracts. More than 50% direct awards. Are you small? You don't have processes, uh, the centralized procurement authority doesn't help you, or what's the problem? And then help them. And this is how we're gonna bring the change on the ground. And professionalization of public, public procurement is a difficult business. It's not like, okay, today, this year, Angelos are gonna do the procurement. I've worked a lot with military defense procurement. It's a profession. You cannot have someone in the artillery, and then next year, you're a public procurement officer. By the time he will find out what are the public procurement rules, he will have to be shifted to another regiment. And this is also for municipalities and all other government institutions. Question one, complete. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, then, then let's move on to DG reform now. Yes, my favorite. You. So each year, DG reform receives more than 60 project requests around the rule of law reform. And I was, and um, of course, and you know, unfortunately, not all of them are selected and approved. So I was just curious, how do you do this whole selection and how do you decide on which are the most relevant and, and most impactful projects to select? So lessons learned for whoever is representing a Bulgarian or other member state institution how to get support from DG reform. We're very lucky to have important reforms like the rule of law from DG home, the justice scoreboard from DG just or the European semester. This is where the country's institutions should look into. And of course other reports right, from Greco, from the uh, working group of bribery for the OECD to look for vulnerabilities and, and come to us and ask for financial support and technical expertise exactly to tackle the vulnerabilities identified in these reports. This will give strength to the, to the, and value to the proposal. 
It's true that uh, the money given by DG reform is a very competitive procedure, both at the level of the member states. So Bulgaria uh, this year had, I think, more than 36 requests in different areas, not just justice. We have five big areas, uh, public administration and uh, corruption, finance, education, health. So you are competing within the country, and then you're competing with all the other member states. So th there are 700 proposals, and only 150 will be selected. Um, in Bulgaria, for example, and linking again with the corruption risk assessment, we were lucky enough, I was uh, early involved in a discussion with the Bulgarian AFCOS. AFCOS is the national uh, entity for coordinated uh, defraud policy around EU funds. Bulgaria is situated in the midst of finance. So I talked with Evailo, he was here this morning. We designed a very good proposal, elements from the Eurobarometer, from rule of law report, from corruption perception index. What is the problem? What, what do Bulgarians think about how EU funds are being used? So for every 10 euros spent, how much value do we get back? Are there enough anti fraud controls in uh, the resilience uh, in the RRF and the other cohesion policy uh, tools or not? So I brought them together with the Cypriot, AFCOS, and also for, with the Greek uh, equivalent, who is responsible for establishing, implementing, and monitoring the national fraud strategy, where a core component is that everyone that deals with EU funds should have in place a robust corruption risk assessment. Unfortunately, in most cases, this is a paper tiger. They are coping last year, and because no one is monitoring, they are just spending hours and resources to something that is not bringing change. So this year we're going to work with the Bulgarian AFCOS, the Cypriot AFCOS, and the Greek Special Service for Institutional Support in EU funds to develop how, how we can make corruption risk assessment a real tool. What are the vulnerabilities? What kind of controls we should establish? More digitalization? Better segregation of duties? Check for ICE principles so when they have a tender there will be someone at the second level checking whether the, this is a photographic uh, tender. And uh, hopefully we're going to start working on that uh, late spring. So this is how it works. The countries must identify their own priorities based on national priorities as well. For example, is subnational strengthening corruption controls at subnational level a priority for Bulgaria? Let's talk with the competent minister the association of municipalities, and let's design together a digital form where content experts, we can work on the ground, hands by hand, with the national practitioners to design a really valuable reform. Not a project to, for a big firm or an, uh, an NGO get money and make revenue, but a reform that on Monday, when the Bulgarian practitioner in a municipality will go, will have a new tool that can really use with no excuses, there are no enough da data, uh, everybody's corrupted, yeah. Let's start, and then we will see, otherwise we will be forever uh, caught up in conferences. And one big thing for corruption risk assessment is, qualitative data are not here for many countries. They are maybe for Australia, I've worked with them, or Canada. For the rest, it's either we wait until the data get mature enough, I hear the colleagues saying that the big problem is in an availability of data, or not allowing access, which is a different uh, risk. But let's start. One year, second year, third year. If we only complain, we'll get nowhere. Incomplete the first year, we learn second, third year. The public administrator matures, accruals, program budgeting. And then at some point, the corruption risk management, the corruption risk would be a real exercise. But we have to start today. If you wait for the whole administration to mature, we will get nowhere. Uh, then let's let's close the circle now. We looked at your national experience, then we looked at the way DG Reform selects the projects. Now just briefly, let's focus on the DG Reform funded projects. So can you share with us some something interesting that came out of the of some funded projects, some innovative techniques and tools, methodologies that to foster rule of law, something from your experience that would be interesting? Yeah. I could mention a lot in the other areas as well. For example, children friendly justice, judicial system, the Barnhouse program. How easy it is for vulnerable groups 
immigrants, women, children get access to justice. So there is a whole series of uh, this kind of projects. I will talk to the Minister of Justice afterwards to see if something like that would be interesting for Bulgaria, called the Bernahus Program. Also, a second area, behavioral insights. Uh, we were with Ms. Mikhail also at the ECD. How we can nudge people towards the right direction, making the ethical choice. For example, procurement experts in the Ministry of Health. Even a simple letter, there are more complicated schemes, like saying, if you do value for money procurement in the machinery, x-ray machinery in hospital, this will result to better health services for your parents, for your grandparents. If you do efficient, economical, and effective, if you value the three E's in procurement, then you will get a better educational system for your children. So corruption, if we had corruption, the benefits, we said before, you cannot see it right away as we pay a fine, but we can create, change the, the mentality. And then coming to the corruption risk assessment, these days, if you put AI in front of your presentation, you're trendy, you're in. Everybody starts with AI, even I do, but I don't know exactly what I'm talking about. So, I mean, I'm talking about AI for auditing. I'm a traditional auditor. I mean, I've been with my pencil, and then I say, okay, let's use it. Leveraging AI over doing more uh, effective uh, audits. Yes, and then? And then nothing, academic. Corruption risk assessment. Identifying fraud patterns with the wealth of data we have now. Imagine in Bulgaria there is electronic uh, pharmaceutical prescription. And we run scenarios and see there are 30,000 doctors in the system. Then suddenly someone in uh, Sofia goes from 1,000 to 5,000. Why? Maybe he got popular. You know. He expanded his uh, clientele. Yeah, let's go and see what happened. There is, there is something, an anomalous trend. Or there is a certain area in Bulgaria where there is a prescription of a lot of medicine for uh, women to get pregnant, even if they are above a certain age. We can find these correlations uh, with the registries now. Okay, let's see why is this happening. Otherwise, we will wait, as we did before in the investigation authorities, for a complaint to come in. When I was uh, at the National Transparency Authority, we received 10,000 complaints per year. And we had a very good system. It can, this is not sustainable. You must, what we say, risk-based investigation. This is what we should do. Use this kind of data. Where are the anomalies? For example, very easy one, 332 municipalities. All of those that have more than 50% direct awards are going to be audited and say that in advance. So if you don't know your business, if you're not professional enough, you're going to be prioritized. So do your business well, train your staff, use the available procedures. Otherwise, we will not wait until you lose the municipality and the next one, this is the usual thing that they do. If they lose the municipality, the new one will say audit the previous one. No, no. no. we'll do it in advance. You will know there are indicators, and if you don't, and if you're high in these indicators, then we will come for you, or ask a declaration. But not, don't use always Michali. Alexander had one house. <laughs> then, <laughs> then next year, two houses. I mean, why? Then after four years as a mayor, a lot of money in the bank. I mean, yeah, okay, you might got lucky with your marriage. I don't know, but let's see. So we're going to audit you. And this is how we can use asset declaration. I've worked with many countries, Latin America, uh, Eastern Europe, on asset declaration. The only solution is put everybody to do an asset declaration. Five million asset declarations in paper. A lot of basements full. You pay rent also for the basement. No. Electronic, risk-based approach. Machine-readable. Machine-readable. Machine yes, of course. This is where I, I, I would use AI here. Okay. <laughs> So put the criteria and then whoever comes on the top, sudden wealth, more houses, a pool, a beach house in Mykonos, we will audit him or her. This is how we can use traditional techniques, advanced traditional techniques, with using big data or small data or whatever data exists. Poor, yeah, poor data, weak data, we use, we learn, and we adapt. That's all, thanks. A lot of food for thought, thank you very much. And I'm sure everyone is already starving. So please, 
uh, remember your questions, mingle, uh, use the lunch break, communicate, ask your questions, and I think we will just, okay, not call it a day, but call it a, a, a panel. And uh, thank, you, thank you very much. See you in the afternoon. Enjoy the lunch. And let's give a round of applause to our wonderful panelists. Thank you.